So I'm going to talk about a little bit about um, Effective Java and um, what's new in the third edition, and then go over some of the items that they've listed. So the author, as most of you probably know, Joshua Block, he's written, um, this is his third uh, edition of Effective Java. He won an award for the first one, and he's worked at Sun Microsystems, Google. He's famous for working on the Java uh, collections framework and even the math package. It's just a bit about him. And the first edition was written in 2001, so it's about 17 years ago. And then the second edition was released about 10 years ago that included updates from Java 5 and 6. And the third edition was released last year, and they kind of touch on uh, Java 7, 8, and even 9. So uh, for the third edition, they focus on uh, a few fundamental libraries, such as Lang, Util, I.O., and even some of the sub-packages, um, the Util concurrent and function. And in total, he lists 90 items, and each item conveys one rule that um, he like, strongly believes or he kind of points out. So he um, provided a table with um, all the different items and like what they kind of go over and what releases they're part of. So I'm going to go over a lot of them, not optionals and streams. If we have time, I'll go over the first item, but everything else. And in order, this not, not in this order, in numerical order. So the first item, nine, uh, to use try with resource as opposed to try finally. So a lot of resources require you to trigger the close method. For example, input streams, output streams, and the SQL connection. And a lot of times developers can overlook this or forget to do it. Um, people try using them in finalizers, but it's not reliable. And he kind of goes over that in item eight about how it's like erratic behavior and it can affect performance. So try finally was the best way to manage closing resources. And I, by the way, most of my examples are straight from the book. So, uh, so he has two examples, the first line of file and uh, copy, where both of them have a try finally. And then he kind of mentions how if both the try and the finally throw some exception before the close even gets triggered, that can cause problems. And also in the stack trace, you would lose the first exception and only get the second one. And also in the second example, because there's more than one stream, it just looks really ugly. So yeah, so both the try and finally box can throw exceptions, and um, the stack trace has no record of the first exception. So the solution, which they introduced in Java 7, is to use try with resource. And, and any interface that you have in there must implement auto-closable. So from this example, you can go to this, where you put your streams or your resources inside the try, and then you don't even need a finally, it'll handle it for you. And it's a lot cleaner, uh, shorter, and um, the exceptions that occur after the first one, they get suppressed, but then you can still see them in the stack trays. So you get everything that you need. Oh, and also you can include a catch so that you can um, return default values if needed. So that's the first item. Um, and then I took some quotes from the book that people might like. Always use try with resource in preference to try finally when working with resources that must be closed. The resulting code is shorter and clearer and the exceptions that it generates are more useful. So the next item is minimize the accessibility of classes and members. And I think he highlighted this one because he kind of briefly goes over modules in them, which was, um, which was part of Java 9. So when you create your classes or your packages, you generally try to separate your API from the implementation so that the inner logic isn't exposed to all the other components that are using it. And it also increases software reusability. 
So generally your top level classes, interfaces are package private or public and package private for um, hiding the inner logic and public for the API. And uh, he also advises that if one of your classes or interfaces is used only once to nest it in the client class that's actually using it. And he kind of goes over that in item 24. So members such as like fields, methods, there's the four access levels that I'm sure everyone knows. And um, his advice is when creating an API to make sure to design what is needed first. So like the bare minimal amount of stuff that needs to be exposed and make sure everything else is private. And um, he also mentions that if you implement serializable, it can cause leaks because it uses like a default serializing form that um, basically exports everything from your, from your class into the API. So then you yeah, kind of have to like support it forever. So general rules to follow. Uh, instance fields of public classes are rarely public and it should be rarely public or never because they're mutable and you don't want anything outside to change them. Static fields um, are generally notated with like the uppercase underscores. Um, they should only be like constants or immutable objects and that for uh, arrays of like length greater than zero, even if you have like an accessor or um, a constant, you can still change them on the outside to make sure that you return an unmodifiable list. So in Java 9, the module system was introduced and it's kind of analogous to um, packages where like you package a bunch of classes. So in a module, you <coughs> group a bunch of packages and um, you can export your packages with like a module info Java file where you can like declare which ones are exposed. And because of this, it introduced two implicit intramodule access levels, which are similar to the package protected in public access levels. And he states that it is too early to say whether modules will achieve widespread use of the JDK itself. In the meantime, it seems best to avoid them unless you have a compelling need. So I've never worked with modules or built them, but I, I guess I don't really know if anyone else has, but th this is what he said. <laughs> and yeah, so just to kind of summarize this item, each class or member should be as inaccessible as possible, design a minimal API, and then make sure any sort of stray classes, members are not part of it and uh, don't expose fields that aren't constants and immutable. So item 21 is design interfaces for posterity. So before Java 8, anytime you would change your interface, everything would break. And um, now they have default methods that can be injected so that all implementations would get that method without any sort of issues. And um, this is an example of um, a default method that was added to the collections interface. That um, So anything that implements collection would get remove if. That basically takes a predicate. If true, it'll remove that element from the collection. So some of the pros is it's good to like add standardized methods for all implementations if the interface is kind of dictating what should be there. And it's fast and effective. Um, a couple cons are that your code may compile but fail at runtime because sometimes when you create these interfaces, you don't know what is being implemented outside of it, so it could cause issues. And also, the purpose of the class may be altered. So they brought up the synchronized collection that it, its promise is to automatically synchronize around each method invocation. However, with the remove if, because that's a default method that it didn't know about, now it has that and it can't deliver its promise. So until they um, override it, it's, it's kind of not delivering its purpose. So the advice is default methods should be avoided unless critical. Uh, combine generics and var args judiciously. So var args allow methods to take a variable number of arguments. So you can have 
a number of arguments and it'll turn them into like an object array. And it's considered a leaky abstraction because the array is created from, from that parameter. And if args are non-reifiable, then the compiler generates a warning. So this is my IDE. I, I have that flatten method that takes um, var args. And then when I try to use it, this is the, um, the warning that I get. So I think most people would use the uh, like that suppressed warnings unchecked to kind of avoid that warning from showing up in the compiler. So it's also prone to having um, heap pollution where um, a variable of a parameterized type refers to an object that is not of that type. So in this dangerous method, um, you can see that objects or int list is being put into the first element of objects, which is a reference of the string lists. And then in the final line, it does the compiler does like a silent cast of string, and then it throws a class cast exception because of that. So then um, here as well, this the last um, in the last couple lines, you can see that uh, when pick two is called, that would also throw a class cast exception because it does a silent um, string cast, but it returns an object, and object arrays are not a subtype of string arrays. Oh, and also the first method is very unsafe because you're basically exposing your object array. So he poses the question, why can we create methods with generic args but are unable to create generic arrays? And he, the answer that he gave was that it's actually because it's very useful and common that the designers of Java were like okay with it. They were okay with the inconsistency. So in Java 7, they introduced the safe vargs annotation so you don't have to use the suppressed warnings. And by using that annotation, you're stating that um, your method is type safe. Like you're providing that promise that your method is a uh, type safe. So here is uh, the exact same method with uh, safe args. So rule of thumb when ensuring that your methods are safe is that your method does not store anything in the args parameter array and that your method does not make the array visible to untrusted code. Kind of like um, that two array. <laughs> and instead of using vars, you can also just create a list of lists and um, list.of uses safe args, so you should be safe. If you choose to write a method with a generic or parameterized var arg parameter, first ensure that the method is type safe and then annotate it with safe args so that it is not unpleasant to use. Uh, prefer lambdas to anonymous classes. So, before you'd use like these function objects where you'd create the, an instance of the interface and then override the compare in this example. And um, these interfaces would generally have one single or a single abstract method. And um, now because it's like very common and popular in Java 8, they renamed these interfaces to functional interfaces. And um, it lets you create instances of these interfaces using Lambda expressions. So um, this is exactly the same as that, but as an expression, expression of Lambda with Lambda. And then, um, so if you notice here, as most of you probably know with Lambdas, there's no um, explicit types anywhere. And what the compiler does, it uses type inference to decide what the types are. And um, it's good practice to not even provide the types unless it makes your code clearer or more easier to understand. And if the compiler cannot infer it, it'll just tell you to explicitly state what's needed. Oh, and it only works on parameter parameterized types. So um, to make that previous example even simpler, 
Uh, Java 8 added a sort method to the list interface, and you can even pass in a comparator construction method, which is like that comparing int. Lambdas lack names and documentation. If a computation isn't self-explanatory or exceeds a few lines, don't put in a lambda. One line is ideal for a lambda, and three lines is a reasonable maximum. I guess a general rule of thumb. Uh, some of the constraints are you're limited to a functional interface, so you can't create an instance with like multiple abstract methods, only a single abstract. And uh, lambdas cannot obtain a reference of itself if it needs to like deregister or something. It can't. Uh, prefer method references to lambdas. So method references are much more su succinct and they're cleaner. And if you have a bunch of parameters in your lambda, instead you could just use a method reference. However, those parameters and that logic that shows up in lambdas are documentation itself and we're kind of losing that by using method references. Um, and he suggests that if a lambda gets too complex to actually just extract it into a method and then use it as a method reference. Um, sometimes lambdas could be more succinct than method references if it's in like the same class, for example, and you have a really long class name. It's easier to use the, the second option over there. So there are six types of method references, static, bound, unbound, class constructors, and array constructors. So static is probably what a lot of us are familiar with, just a, a method from a class and it would take the argument and pass it to the method. For bound, it's when a receiving object is specified in the method reference, and it's kind of similar to static methods, and um, the function object takes the same argument as the referenced method. So in this example, the instance dot now um, is after is being applied to the instance, and the argument's being passed into the method. Uh, whereas unbound is um, the method is being applied to the argument being passed in. And constructor method references are just like factory objects to create. Where method references are shorter and clearer, use them. Where they aren't, stick with lambdas. Favor of use of standard functional interfaces. So as opposed to creating your own, the Java Util function has about 43 interfaces to choose from. And uh, there's six basic ones with like various, um, or different variations of them. So um, he recommends try using one of those. If you can't, then create your own. So these are the six basic ones, the unary operator, where it takes in a parameter and returns something of that same type. The binary, where it takes two arguments. The predicate, where it takes one and returns a Boolean. Function, where it takes one and then returns something else. The supplier, where it retrieves something for you. And the consumer, where it takes an argument and just does something with it. So, as you mentioned, there was 43 to choose from. So from the six there, there's uh, three different primitive types of each one for uh, int, long, and double. So then there's like long binary operator or um, double uh, predicate. So then now we're at 24. And then a function has um, actually six source to result because there's like long to int, long to double, and um, you wouldn't have long to long because that's the same as a unary operator. But so in total there's six, and then you can also have some, there's three with an object reference, so like double to object, long to object. So that plus nine. And then the two argument variations, so there's like a by predicate um, where it takes two arguments, and then they have that for uh, function as well, to int by function. So in total there's nine of those. And there's one special one for the supplier called the Boolean supplier. It's the only one that explicitly states Boolean, whereas predicate, it's just kind of like implicitly returned. And uh, yeah, the Boolean supplier doesn't take any arguments. It just returns a Boolean value. So those are the 43. 
and I think I have a lot of time. So um, use streams judiciously. So streams were added in Java 8 to simplify all processing sequentially or in parallel. Um, a stream is a sequence of data elements, and then you have your stream pipeline, which has like different um, computations, such as like map filtering, and those are called intermediate operations, and then one terminal operation at the end to do something with all those elements, like collect it or print it. And overusing streams make programs hard to read and maintain. So in this example, it's basically taking an entire dictionary and getting all the words and creating buckets of anagrams. So it'd be like the key value is like an alphabetized version. And then the value would be a set of all the different anagrams in the dictionary. So you'd have, you have a stream of, your, um, of the chars, and then that's going into the grouping by. And then you have another stream at the end. So it kind of gets very complicated and hard to read. So what he did was he extracted out the alphabetizing part, and he just separated that so that the uh, first one looks a lot shorter and much more easier to read. Oh, and also in um, the alphabetized method, um, streams do not offer direct support for char. So here is an example of that, like hello world. Um, it, prints, it actually prints that out instead for each um, character because string char methods return an in stream. So you'd have to cast it like in the bottom. So his advice is, in the absence of explicit types, careful naming of lambda parameters is essential to the readability of stream pipelines. So um, because it can get really like big and heavy, it's kind of really important that you start naming things correctly so it's very easy to understand what's going on. And uh, using helper methods is even more important for readability in stream pipelines than in iterative code. So like using the alphabetize. And if you're not sure whether a task is better served by streams or iteration, try both and see which works better for you. And that's it. <laughs> and these are the resources I used. Um, he has a GitHub of all the sample code that he uses in the book. And there's a talk of him doing on some of the stream and Lambda stuff. So. Yeah.